Okay, so uh, we're going to start another um, section in the book of Joshua. And um, we finished up verses 1 through 9 of the first chapter uh, a little over a week ago. And so today we will finish the whole chapter uh, 11 through verse 18. And um, the general idea now is if we translate it into the New Testament uh, aspect of salvation, um, we're going to be talking about living the abundant life, um, living the kind of life that God had planned for us in the first place. And as we look back in the Old Testament, and as we look back to uh, the situation with Joshua, we can see that God had intended his people when they left Egypt to go into the promised land. But because of sin, because of, of doubt, uh, lack of faith, um, they chose not to go in. They thought it was too difficult, too hard. And therefore, they ended up wandering in the wilderness for um, 40 years until most of those people had died out. And there was still a Joshua and Caleb left. And Moses brought them right up to uh, the edge of the promised land and uh, the Jordan River. And there he died. God turned um, the uh, leadership over to Joshua, and uh, and Joshua was the one to lead them into the promised land. Now, uh, also, you can take note that the name Joshua is the same as the name Jesus. Jesus is the translation of that same name in the Greek in the New Testament. And so um, we have a kind of a comparison here. Joshua was the one that uh, took them from uh, Moses, who had brought them the law, and then brought them, oh, Joshua was the one that was able to take them over into the promised land. And Jesus is the one that uh, has fulfilled the law and has taken us into the promised land. Um, we're not talking about heaven at this point. We're talking about the uh, abundant Christian life. Uh, being born again and coming, becoming one of his children. And so as we look at this, I want you to kind of think about that a little bit, because, you know, uh, even though salvation is a free gift and, and Jesus has paid all of that, but when we are saved and when we want to begin to live the Christian life, it's not always easy. We must claim it. We must claim the promises of God. We must begin to um, to trust totally in him and not just for salvation, but in a sense for everyday living. And so uh, let's take a look and see what happens after Joshua has been called to take over for Moses. Verse 10, then Joshua commanded the officers of the people saying, pass through the camp and command the people saying, prepare provisions for yourselves for within three days, you will cross over this Jordan to go in to possess the land, which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. And to the Reubenites, the Gittites, and half the tribe of Manasseh, Joshua spoke, saying, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is giving you rest and is giving you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land, which Moses gave you on this side of the Jordan. But you shall pass before your brethren armed, all your mighty men of valor, and help them until the Lord has given your brethren rest as he gave you. And they also have taken possession of the land which the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and enjoy it, which Moses the Lord's servant gave you on this side of the Jordan toward the sunrise. So they answered Joshua, saying, All that you commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we heeded Moses in all things, so we will heed you. Only the Lord your God be with you, as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your command and does not heed your words in all that you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and of good courage." Well, it's quite interesting to look at this. You see, um, Joshua had received uh, God's calling upon his life. God told him he was now to take over where Moses left off and deliver the people into the land of promise. 
And so Joshua was one of the two uh, spies that had gone in with the 12 and he and Caleb had come out saying the, the land is plentiful. Uh, it is ours for the taking. God has given it to us. Let's go and possess the land. The other 10 had doubts. They looked and they said, um, they are like giants in our eyes and we are like grasshoppers in their eyes. They said, it, this is too big for us. It reminds me a little bit about when, uh, when people are asked to take on great challenges in the church, and there's always several that'll say, I don't see it. It's not possible. It would be too hard. It's too costly. We can't do it. The truth is we can't do it, but if God calls us to do it, he will do it through us and use us, and we will be the beneficiaries of, uh, of, of being a part of his great work. And, uh, and the people of God back in that day missed out on so much because of their lack of faith. I would encourage each of us to realize that God wants us to have an abundant life in Christ. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And so he desires us to have a full life. And he's made many, many promises in his word that we can count on. And so as we take a look at these, this um, area of scripture here, I want us to look at a few things. One is... Um, if we either individually and collectively are going to possess the land and be all that God intended for us to be, then we're going to need a couple of things here at Calvary. Um, we're going to need leaders and we're going to need a plan. You see here, it says that first of all, there was Joshua, but then it says Joshua, uh, commanded the officers of the people. So, he went to the leaders of the people and he worked with them. And it was very important that they too would take up um, the work to be done. And they were ready to work through their people. And then it says in there also, prepare provisions for yourself for within three days, you will cross over this Jordan. It was the beginning of a plan, prepare. So, you know, here at Calvary, one of the things we need to be preparing now for the fact that God has plans for Calvary uh, in these upcoming months, this next year or whatever, that he is um, making some plans, wants us to uh, put those plans uh, not only on paper, but then to work those plans. And so it's something that I'm hoping that we're going to be involved in. And I need you. Um, I need all of those that God would raise up as leaders here at Calvary to um, be hands-on workers to participate in what we're um, you know, what we're planning to do, what God wants us to do. So the first thing, the principle of living the abundant life, is that we are to listen to our leaders. We're to uh, become leaders ourselves as, as uh, we are given those opportunities, and then also we are to uh, plan the work, and then, as it says, work the plan. And, uh, and so God desires for us to grow. God desires not just uh, numerically, I'm talking about spiritually. And if we grow spiritually, then we will grow numerically. We will see people saved. We'll see people uh, growing uh, and, and getting involved in ministry. We'll see Calvary rising up and, and becoming the church that God desires this church to be. Uh, when I think about the fact that for 40 years, the, the people of God, uh, wandered uh, in the wilderness because of their lack of faith. Um, I don't ever want to be in that situation. I don't want to do that because I know God doesn't want that for me. And if I will just um, uh, apprehend his promises, um, live by his promises, believe in his promises, um, I, I will experience this abundant life. And for Diane and I, for over the last 40 years, uh, 40 plus years, I guess, since I've been saved, we've been doing that. And because of that, we look back and see how many wonderful things God has done in our lives. And if we had not stepped out of faith, uh, we would not have seen those things. They would not have just happened. And so, um, uh, and, I, and I'm thinking that even coming here to Calvary at this point is a step of faith. It's a step of, of, uh, of coming out and saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? And what are you going to do here for the people of Calvary? And I believe that God has given all of us promises. And I believe here he has this place situated and primed and ready to, uh, uh, 
uh, to move into, if you will, the promised land and see things happen. So as we look at this, there's the idea of forming leaders and then forming a plan and working that plan so that we do not spend any time wandering in the wilderness. And, uh, and so the other thing that I see in these passages of Scripture is the importance of that we are all one. You know, he, uh, he approaches the, um, uh, the two and a half tribes. There's 12 tribes, of course, to, to Israel. These are the two and a half tribes. It says to the Reubenites, the Gedites, and half the tribe of Manasseh. These were the, the two and a half tribes that had asked Moses if it would be okay if they settled on the other side of the Jordan. And I mean, that would, that was also very, it was safer, but I don't think that was the reason they, they really uh, felt like that place was um, their calling. That's where they felt they needed to be. Um, and Moses had them agree that although he was fine with them staying there, that they needed to join the other nine and a half tribes uh, going over onto the other side of the Jordan and possessing the land because it takes all of us. It takes the whole team working. It takes the whole family. And as I relate that to us here at Calvary, I, I think about the fact that um, we can't have some spectators. Uh, we can't even just have some cheerleaders or some part-time participants. We need everybody getting on board, embracing the, the promises, embra embracing the vision, and, uh, and getting on board and saying, where do I fit in? Well, how can I help? Uh, you might say, well, my life's going pretty good right now, and, and I'm quite comfortable and quite content. Well, so were the two and a half tribes on the other side of the Jordan. They knew that God had called them all together. You're here at this church for a purpose. And uh, I would just encourage you to say, as these two and a half tribes, we will do as you say. And we will not stop until we've reached the goal of the whole church, not just our part but everybody. And so we need to work as a team. You know, in um, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, Paul talks about the spiritual gifts. And in fact, uh, we're going to be finishing up. We're going we're gonna to gather up and do these, uh, the spiritual gifts uh, inventories and the study coming up here now. Um, pretty soon, we're going to stop on Wednesday nights, the Mark study, and we're going to uh, go through the spiritual gift study. If you have one of those books, then I would encourage you to start reading it. If you haven't already, have it with you um, and when you come on Wednesday nights so that we can begin to, to finish that book up. Why? Well, the plan has been to just do like one chapter a month and time is wasting. I, I mean, we can't, we, we don't have that much time. We, here it says, there's a, and a lot of time, it says in three days time, we're going to go. And so uh, I believe God is saying in that sense, there's a certain allotted time, and then we got to be ready to work. So there's a little bit of preparation time. It says prepare, prepare your, uh, your food and everything else that you're going to need for this trip and for this battle. Yes, we need to be prepared. But, uh, but we don't have months and months and months, I don't, I don't think. We need to, to get on with the study at hand. And so we're going to be doing that on Wednesdays. And it takes everybody. Uh, as I was starting to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it talks about the body of Christ. Uh, we are all essential. Uh, we're not all doing the same role. We all have different parts to play, but we need the whole body operating. And we are concerned if there's somebody else that is not uh, fulfilled or if there's somebody else that is uh, suffering some kind of issue, then as a whole body, we should be concerned for that. So I, I like this idea that that um, Israel needed all 12 tribes playing a role so that they could come and possess the land. Now, of course, we do know that uh, it's God that's giving them the victory. In fact, um, in the very first battle they fight at Jericho, um, it's a very unorthodox approach to a battle. Uh, even though Joshua had been a warrior and a general and a leader, uh, he heard from God to say, I want you to have the uh, uh, the choir, if you will, the uh, instrument players out in front, and they will be playing and they will be blowing on a trumpet. And, and uh, after a certain 
many days that they're going to be marching around the city. They will blow the trumpet, break the the clay pots, and uh, and then the walls came tumbling down, and God had delivered the, the city of Jericho into the Israelites' hands. He was showing from the very beginning that the, the battle is his, but the people were still involved. They had to play a role. They had to uh, be a part of that, and, and here we see that there's a, a lot of stuff to do here in Gaylord. The battle truly is still the Lord's, but he wants us to be involved in that. And so we, we must um, play our, our role, play our part, do our part, I guess I should say, and, um, and become one body moving forward for the purposes of God. And uh, so we, we need to be like the people here said towards the end. It says, um, we will do all that you command us. Uh, we will do and, and go wherever you send us. Um, they were all in. Folks, this is what it's going to take. Uh, the reason why they couldn't go and possess the land before was because they weren't all on the same page. They weren't all in. Uh, some of them were saying, nope, I didn't sign up for this. I'm not, I'm not doing it. I want to encourage you, everybody to play a role in this, to, to get on board and for all of us to, to say, uh, this is, this is what we need to be doing. Um, there is a, uh, thing going on, uh, next, this, this next month. Um, and there's going to be a training about, um, vision casting and the people buying in to the vision. Uh, it's, it's very important that the church get on the same page, just like the Israelites all had to eventually get on the same page. They had to say, we will follow you. We will do what God, as long as you're following God, we will follow you. You know, that's what, that's what he says here at the, at the very end of chapter one. It says, um, um, it says only the Lord, your God be with you as he was with Moses. And so they believed and they knew that God had been leading Moses. And now they were saying to Joshua, we'll follow you. We'll obey what you're saying. We will buy into the vision that you have as long as we know that that vision has come from God and that you are following God as Moses had followed God. And then the very last words of the first chapter, they say to him, only be strong and of good courage. They are um, echoing. The, what uh, God had said to Joshua three other times earlier in his call to Joshua. And so now they're saying, if you're strong and courageous, if you are following God, um, we will um, buy into your vision. We will accept that same calling. We will be a part of a, of a large army fighting all together to carry out the purposes of God. And that's what's going to happen. And we're going to see that. And we're also going to see some battles that take place. It doesn't mean that just because we all agree and we're all ready to go, that it's a simple task. It isn't. However, it is a doable task when God is um, at work. And that's something very exciting for you to be a part of. We need to accept the promises of God and we need to begin living in those promises of God, according to those promises of God, take ownership of this. So um, one of the things, here are three quick things I want you to just to take away from in, in this um, idea. One is we can do this because of God's presence. He said to, to Joshua, um, wherever you go, I will be with you. When Jesus gave the, the great commission, he said, all authority under heaven and earth has been given unto me. And, he, and then he says, and wherever you go, I will be with you always, even unto the end of the age. So we know that the Great Commission wasn't just given to us and then we're sent out. He is going with us. He will be the one that makes it possible for us to do the Great Commission. Only with God involved can we even do the Great Commission. And, uh, and so his presence is is very important and um and then there is the idea of god's promises which we've already talked about he said this land i'm giving to you he promised it to abraham he's promised it again to to moses and now he's promising joshua and the people that everywhere your your feet um uh land i am giving to you they must live by his promises you know 
Um, I don't know the exact number. Um, somebody's probably counted them. But in the Bible, there are thousands of promises that God has given to his people. And uh, and it's like we're not apprehending those. We're not uh, we're not accepting those. Uh, so we, we have to understand that not only will he be with us, but that he has promised many different things, including uh, that the battle is his. That if we fight him in, in uh, God's power, we will see victory. Uh, he said to Moses, no one will be able to stand against you. So we know, although there may be people coming against us, just like in the book of Nehemiah, which we're studying now on Sunday mornings at the at uh, Sunday school hour, um, we see in Nehemiah. Yeah, he had uh, people who were coming out against him. But in reality, he still had the victory. God gave him the victory. And so that is true also. And of course, that just bring, sums us up by simply saying that the other important aspect is that God's power. Um, I heard this the other day uh, in the book of Numbers, chapter 11. Um, Moses is exhausted. He's been trying to lead the people. And they are causing him all sorts of headaches and all sorts of trouble. And, uh, and now they're bickering about eating and all of this. And, and so Moses comes to God and he says, I can't do this. Just kill me so I don't have to hear any of this anymore. Just He, he was suicidal, if you will. I mean, he was that depressed. He was that upset. He just couldn't handle it all. He was all by himself. Too much pressure on him to take care of all of these, these people. And God said, call out from among you 70 people, uh, and I will take a portion of the spirit that I've put upon you and put it on each one of them so that they will all be working together uh, with my power. And so he did that. And uh, there were then 70 elders, if you will, uh, there um, prophesying, um, speaking the word of God, encouraging the people. That must have been a great encouragement to Moses, who was ready to give up because he felt like he was the only one who was buying into the vision, the only one that was leading the people. Now there's 70 other folks encouraging. I know, as an example, that um, when other people buy into the same vision that I believe God has given to me, I just it just takes so much pressure off of you, and you just feel so, um, in a sense, a, a, not only a sense of relief, but of teamwork. You think, wow, we're all in this together. This is we're all headed in the same direction. It's like when people are rowing in a boat. If if two people are rowing in one direction, the other two are rowing in another direction, it, you're not going to get anywhere. Uh, in many cases, you might just go around in circles. Um, and that's that's the problem of a church that's divided. Uh, we need to be on the same page. We need to have this kind of thing. So um, Moses was really encouraged at this point. However, <laughs> apparently Joshua didn't see it. He didn't understand, possibly because he had not been in leadership position. He was like, second to Moses, and he was really Moses' um, servant and, um, and his commander uh, of, of, the, of the military. And so he saw it in a different way, and he thought somehow that this was usurping the authority of Moses as the leader. And Moses said to him, um, he said, why are you zealous? Are you zealous for me? Are you jealous for me? That idea that you think that I have lost power? Oh, no. He says, I am so grateful that God has uh, put his spirit upon these 70 men. In fact, he says, I wish that all of the people of God would be his prophets, that all of the people would have his spirit upon them. Was that Moses looking at forward to what it would be like one day in the church age? Uh, when people who uh, become a part of the family of God receive his spirit, all of us who are born again, all of us who are his children, have the spirit of God. If that's the case, and I, and I believe it is, why is it that we're not operating with that kind of power in our lives and in the lives of the churches? Why are they falling down? Why are there so many spectators or consumers, as some have called it, sitting in our pews. They come 
to to watch. Very little participation, maybe in the singing or maybe a, an occasional amen. But in, as far as the movement of the church, their participation would be maybe an, an offering of some sort, a financial offering. And that's that's sufficient. But um, in this day and age, and any time actually, but uh, today, way too many people think consumerism is a part of the church and that that's what they are okay to do. In fact, they come to a church and say, what do you have to offer me? <laughs> I'll tell you what we have to offer you. We have a place for you to serve. That's what we have to offer you. We have a place where you'll be loved. That's what we have to offer you. We have a place where you'll hear God's word, where you can gather together and draw strength with from each other and worship the almighty God. That's what we have to offer. What do you have to offer? That's that's maybe even a bigger question because the truth is um, you're not to be a consumer. You're not to be a spectator. You're to be a participant uh, in the Lord's army uh, and carrying these things out. There, you could not have that in the day of Joshua. They never would have been able to possess the land. If people said, we'll just watch, you guys go ahead. No, at this point, God was calling all of his people to be obedient. And today, I believe the same thing. He's calling all of us to be obedient to him. And then we will see that um, uh, it's important for us to realize that we are to walk according to his spirit, that he is with us, and we are to fight in his strength because he empowers us. So, folks, I don't know what your situation is today. Um, but I pray that you will make a decision to be all in here at Calvary and say, all right, let's join forces. Let's join together. Let's join with God to carry out and to fulfill the vision that he has for us and for Calvary. Thank you, folks. It's good to be with you this evening.